In those days, Malalul, the son of Canaan, lived 65 years, and he begat Jared. And Jared lived 60 years. Afterwards, Jared begat Enoch. Now Enoch lived 65 years, and during these years, he walked with God after having begat his son, Methuselah. These years were troublesome times, and the Lord was known to be angry in those days, growing so vexed that he despised the evil ways of men. But Enoch was different. He was blessed with knowledge and understanding of the Lord, and with that, he wisely retired from the sons of men and sequestered himself away from them for many days. Though Enoch was hidden from the rest of man, he did not remain hidden from his God, and so he continued to pray to him with passionate commitment until one day an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Behold, here I am. And the angel declared to Enoch, Go forth from thy house and from the place where thou dost hide thyself and appear to those sons of men in order that thou mayest teach them the way in which they should go and the work which they must accomplish to enter the ways of God. And Enoch rose wordlessly, for the angel was simply breathtaking. He lowered his head to the ground in recognition of the divine entity, and did just as the angel had instructed. He went forth from his house, from his place, and from the chamber in which he was concealed, and went to the sons of men to teach them the ways of the Lord. Come, all those who will hear the truth, come, hear my words. They were given to me by the angel of God, the Lord, our maker, he who has given us life, and he who grows angry at us with each passing day. And Enoch declared it to every place where the sons of men dwelt. And he said unto them, that if they wished to know the ways of the Lord and his good works, then they would come to him at once. In those days, all the sons of men did assemble before him, and there Enoch reigned over them according to the words he had received from the angel on behalf of the Lord. After the sons of men had heard the words of Enoch, they each bowed their heads low, for they now knew the truth. It was true in those days that the Spirit of God was upon Enoch, and he taught all the men the wisdom and the ways of God. So the sons of men came to serve the Lord in those days, and it was because of Enoch that God slowed his anger toward them and shined on them instead. Now when all the kings, princes, and judges of the land heard of Enoch's wisdom, they too sought to acknowledge him, and journeyed far to bow their own heads before him. And they also acquiesced to Enoch, despite their political powers, and requested that he reign over them thereafter, which Enoch agreed to. And the number of these powerful men who kneeled before Enoch was 133 kings and princes, and they did indeed make Enoch the king of kings, for they and their households and kingdoms were under his command. There Enoch taught them wisdom, knowledge, and the ways of the Lord, as he had promised, and he made peace amongst all the sons of men. In those days, during the times of Enoch, there was peace throughout all the lands. Enoch reigned over the sons of men for 243 years, and he did justice and righteousness with all his people, and he led them in the ways of the Lord. Thus, the generations of Enoch were Methuselah, Elisha, and Elimelech, three sons, and their sisters were Melchah and Nama. Methuselah lived 87 years, and then he begat Lamech. During these years, Adam, who was 933 years old, died, and at his death, Lamech, along with his two sons, as well as Enoch and Methuselah, buried Adam with great ceremony, in a cave which God had appointed for him. In that very place, the sons of men mourned greatly on behalf of Adam, the first man, and since then, the ritual of burying the dead became a custom among the sons of men, to this very day. It was in that year of Adam's death, the 243rd year of Enoch's reign, did Enoch resolve to separate from the sons of men once more, and to once again sequester himself away to serve the Lord. And Enoch did so, 
but did not entirely secret himself from them, but kept away from the sons of men for three days, and then went to them for one day. On the three days that he remained in his chamber, he prayed to and praised the Lord, his God. And the day on which he went and appeared to his subjects, he taught them everything he had learned. Indeed, everything the sons of men asked him about the Lord, he told them. For many years did Enoch do this, until afterward he began to hide himself for six days at a time, only appearing to the sons of men one day in the seven. After that, he only showed himself once a month, and then, after that, only once a year, until the kings, princes and men grew impatient and desired to see him again. So off they went in search of Enoch, to see his face and hear his words, but little did they find. For it was said in those times that all the sons of men had become greatly afraid of Enoch, on account of his ability to commune with God, and his very own holy aura that had been blessed upon him. Indeed, the sons of men were scared of Enoch, and though they wished to see him again, they dared not trespass nor approach him. It soon came to pass that no man could look at Enoch for fear that he might be punished and killed. But the kings, the princes and the judges resolved to assemble the sons of men in search of Enoch, for they believed that if they were united when Enoch emerged, he might speak to them again. And the day did come when Enoch came out of hiding, and there were the sons of men assembled before him. So Enoch spoke to them, and he said unto them again, the words he had been told by the Lord, those that contained his wisdom and his knowledge. With this, they bowed down before him, and they said, May the king live, may the king live. Now some time after, when the kings and princes and sons of men were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching them the ways of God, an angel of the Lord then called unto Enoch from heaven, and wished to bring him up to heaven. Enoch, said the angel, the Lord has seen your good work on earth and wishes to see it done in heaven too. As you have reigned over the sons of men and brought peace, so too will you now reign over the sons of God. Now upon hearing this, Enoch knew the decision had already been made by God. Therefore, he set out immediately to inform the inhabitants of earth that soon he would ascend to heaven to rule over the sons of God. And so he would be leaving them and the reign of Enoch over man would be over. Say it's not so, cried the sons of men. Who will lead us now? wept the princes of men. Must we lose you at all? lamented the kings of men. Indeed, I must go, Enoch told them, for the Lord, our God, has chosen me to reign in heaven over his angels, the way I have reigned over you. But know this, I will teach you all the remaining wisdom and knowledge given to me by God. I will give you all necessary instruction before I leave you, and you will know how to act upon the earth. And so Enoch did as he said, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge, and gave them instruction, and he reproved them, and he placed before them judgments to do upon the earth, and he made peace amongst them, and he taught them everlasting life, and dwelt with them some time, teaching them all these things. It was during one of these very times, when the sons of men were learning from Enoch, did they lift their eyes up and behold the likeness of a great horse descending from the heavens. The time has come where I must go from you, and I shall no more be seen by you, Enoch told them. And the horse descended to the earth and stood before Enoch, and all the sons of men that were with Enoch saw him. Enoch said unto them, Where is the man who delighteth to know the ways of the Lord his God? Let him come this day to me, before I am taken from you. And so all the sons of men assembled and came to Enoch that day, as did the judges, the princes, and the kings, who remained with him that day. There Enoch taught them their final lesson, where he shared with them wisdom, knowledge, and divine instruction. He bade them serve the Lord and walk in his ways all the days of their lives, and he continued to make peace amongst them, even then, on his last day. 
It was after this that he rose up and mounted the horse, and he went forth, and all the sons of men went after him, about 800,000 men, and they followed after him for a whole day's ride. On the second day, Enoch turned to them and he said, Return to your homes, none of us knows what lies ahead. If you follow me, you might die. Upon hearing this, some of the sons of men grew scared and lost faith. So they went from him and returned home. Those that did remain with him followed him for four more days, and though he did warn them that if they followed him, they might die, they were not willing to return to their homes, and instead went with him. By the sixth day, some of the men remained and clung to him, and they said to him, We will go with thee to the place where thou goest, as the Lord liveth, only death shall separate us. So persistent were these sons of men that Enoch ceased warning them, for they could not be convinced to return home. These sons of men who clung to Enoch in those days did go after him, but as Enoch had warned, they did not return. Now when the kings returned to their homes, they decided to take a census in order to know the number of those who had remained and those who had followed Enoch. It was on the seventh day did Enoch ascend into the heavens in a whirlwind, with horses and chariots of fire. Enoch was taken up by the Lord to reign over the sons of God, his angels, just as he had reigned over the sons of men, in his days. Meanwhile, on the eighth day, all the kings that had been with Enoch sought to bring back the men who had followed him to the end, in that very spot from which he ascended to heaven. And all those kings went to that very place, only to find that the earth there was filled with snow. And upon the snow were large stones that were also made of snow. There one said to the other, Come, let us break through the snowstones and see what lies there. Perhaps those who followed Enoch are dead and were since buried there. So the kings did break through the snowstones, but they did not find the bodies of those who had followed Enoch. So they sought thereafter in hopes of finding Enoch one last time. But they never did find him, for he had truly ascended into heaven. Much of what we've seen here in the apocryphal book of Jasher does not appear in the traditional Bible, or at least, not in so many words. Here in chapter 3 of Jasher, the focus shifts onto one of the more elusive biblical characters in Enoch, who we know from the Bible was a descendant of Adam, and one who was taken from the earth by God in a less traditional manner. Indeed, Enoch's role in the biblical Genesis is extremely minimal, and for the most part, his contribution to the narrative is easily overlooked, for it is really confined to only a few lines. We are told in Genesis of Enoch, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years, and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more, because God took him away. As we can see, much of this is congruent with the book of Jasher, which also tells us that Enoch walked faithfully with God, and that after some time, God took him away. However, where Genesis leaves the rest to the reader's imagination, the book of Jasher seeks to tell readers exactly what this means. In Jasher, we are given not only a reason why Enoch was taken away, so that he can become something of a king in heaven and reign over the angels, or the sons of God, but also the means in which he was taken, by being brought to a certain place by a divine horse and then snatched up in a whirlwind of horses, chariots and fire. Readers may see parallels between this account and the account of Elijah in chapter 2 of the second book of Kings, where we are told, as Elijah and Elisha were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, and Elisha saw him no more. 
It is interesting that in the Bible, Elijah is taken up to heaven in virtually the same exact way that Enoch is in Jasher. Neither man actually dies, but instead are spared death by being handpicked by God to join him in heaven. Now, whilst Jasher explains that God had a purpose for Enoch, the purpose for Elijah isn't really told to us. Some have speculated that both Enoch and Elijah were taken up to heaven by God because God wished to spare them from the atrocities being committed by man during those times, and because their behaviour was so exemplary that God wished to preserve them. On the other hand, one suggestion is that God wished to use both Enoch and Elijah as the two witnesses as seen in Revelation, who come back down to earth in the end times to prophecy for 1260 days. But this cannot be confirmed by the biblical count alone. What can be confirmed though, is that Enoch and Elijah are the only two people in the Bible who are spared death in this manner. So it does suggest that God either really, really, really liked these two fellows, or he did indeed have a greater plan for them. If we look further into the Bible, notably Hebrews 11.5, we are given a little more detail into Enoch's transition into heaven. We are told, by faith, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. This only reinforces the idea that God had taken a shine to Enoch, wishing to not only spare him from experiencing death, but also as a reward for being one who was commended as pleasing God. Some believers also deduce that this is what will happen during the end times, more specifically, the rapture. The idea is that those who are moral and good and have come to please God, as Enoch or Elijah had done, will be snatched from the earth by God and placed into heaven, thus avoiding death. It's unclear whether this will be done in the same manner according to belief, or whether there will be whirlwinds of chariots and fire, but those who are faithful maintain that the rapture is something that will transpire in the end times, and that like Enoch, they too will be plucked from the earth and placed into heaven. One portion of the story in Jasher that interested me is how God chooses Enoch to reign not only over the sons of man, but the sons of God too. The angels, if you will. This idea is quite provocative when you think about the traditional hierarchy between angels and humans. Angels have always been revered in holy scriptures and modern belief. These are the beings that strike fear and awe both in those who witness them in the Bible. And these are the beings that are capable of offering divine assistance and thwarting evil. There is no question, according to biblical narrative or traditional belief, angels are immensely powerful, far more powerful than any one human can ever hope to be. Yet here we see a human in Enoch appointed to rule over these very angels and to govern over them as he had once governed over the men on earth. Did God really value Enoch this much that he would place him above his very own angels? Well, going by the book of Jasher, it seems very much so. It harkens back to the pseudepigraphical book of Enoch, where the watchers, who were fallen angels, are essentially read their rights by Enoch, who is appointed to deliver unto them the verdict of their punishment. In this story, God values Enoch so much so that he becomes God's voice when sentencing the angels for the evils they had committed on the earth. But there are other aspects from this chapter of the book of Jasher, aside from Enoch's rapture, if you will, that give us a lot to think about. Enoch, from the very get-go of the chapter, is established as an exceptional character who is blessed with uncanny, maybe even divine wisdom. We are told, and the soul of Enoch was wrapped up in the instruction of the Lord, in knowledge and in understanding. And he wisely retired from the sons of men, and secreted himself from them for many days. Already we are given context as to what makes Enoch so special, and why God may have wanted to take him from the earth, and pocket him away like a little collectible. He is wrapped up in the instruction of the Lord, in that he didn't do anything that the Lord didn't tell him to. Furthermore, he had a knowledge and understanding of God that no other man at that point in time had managed to achieve. 
so perhaps this god in Jasha felt like he had a connection with Enoch and felt like this was someone who actually heard him. We also come to learn that Enoch went through these phases of isolation, where he removed himself from society and spent time alone, or perhaps more accurately, according to the narrative, spent exclusive time with his god, where he increased his understanding and wisdom. Now, whilst he's doing these streaks of isolation, he does come into contact with an angel. Now, this angel is never given a name in the account by Jasher, but there are some parallels to the Book of Enoch, where Enoch is approached by the Archangel Uriel, who actually tells him to go and sequester himself away. And it was at the expiration of many years, whilst he was serving the Lord and praying before him in his house, that an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Rise and go forth from thy house, and from the place where thou dost hide thyself, and appear to the sons of men, in order that thou mayest teach them the way in which they should go, and the work which they must accomplish, to enter in the ways of God. In this account by Jasher, the angel is nameless, but that doesn't detract from the significance of this encounter. Like with the Enochian account, Enoch is told by the angel to hide, but not just this, but to also teach the sons of men what they must do in order to enter the ways of God. It's a responsibility that Enoch had probably not expected, but it is one he knows he has no choice but to undertake. For how does one say no to an angel? Although, knowing what we do know of Enoch, it's likely he would have jumped at this opportunity to demonstrate his loyalty and commitment to his God. Teaching the sons of men the ways of the Lord, especially in these unruly times, would have been quite the daunting task. Furthermore, Enoch is never really given a strategy or a recommended approach for how to achieve this. He is only told that it is what God wanted him to do, meaning Enoch had to either figure out the logistics for himself, or perhaps better yet, had to trust that God would guide him. Now, Enoch doesn't seem to hesitate in this matter at all, and seems to just get stuck in, as we are told, And Enoch rose up, according to the word of the Lord, and went forth from his house, from his place, and from the chamber in which he was concealed. And he went to the sons of men, and taught them the ways of the Lord. And at that time, assembled the sons of men, and acquainted them with the instruction of the Lord. As we later see, Enoch's efforts are unanimously successful, He's not only able to speak to all the sons of men, but he actually gets them all on side too. We are told that all the sons of men assemble to him, and that Enoch did reign over them, as was the intention of the Lord. After this, the sons of men come across as almost zealous in the face of Enoch. They are seen to gather around him, listen to him, and even bow to him, as if he was their king. And to make matters even somewhat more absurd, even the actual kings of the land end up doing the same thing. We are told, And all the kings of the sons of men, both first and last, together with their princes and judges, came to Enoch when they heard of his wisdom. And they bowed down to him, and they also required of Enoch to reign over them, to which he consented. And they assembled in all 130 kings and princes, and they made Enoch king over them, and they were all under his power and command. Here we are then told that Enoch would reign for 243 years, and that during these years, there was peace on the earth. It just goes to show the kind of effect that Enoch had on these people, that even kings, princes, and men of significant political power would willingly cast aside their own importance in favour of serving Enoch. It shows us that at least during these dark and troubled times, that thanks to Enoch, men did come to value God over their own fame and success, and that because of this, there was a short period of peace, 243 years of peace to be exact. And Enoch taught them wisdom, knowledge, and the ways of the Lord, and he made peace amongst them, and peace was throughout the earth during the life of Enoch. After this, we are given a short family legacy of Enoch, where we are told that he had three sons, Methuselah, Elisha, and Elimelech, and two daughters, 
Melchor, and Nama. Interestingly, Methuselah in the Bible is credited with living a whopping 969 years, which is the longest that any biblical character is said to have lived for. We are also told here in Jasher that Methuselah was 87 when he begat his son Lamech. Of Enoch's wife, however, we are not given any information, and her identity is never actually revealed to us. In Enoch's final year on the earth, we learn that Adam dies at the age of 930 years, seemingly of natural causes. In Jasher, this is treated as a particularly significant event, with Enoch and Methuselah, as well as two unnamed sons of Adam, burying Adam with great pomp in a cave outlined by God. What's interesting about this account is that Jasher seems to imply that Adam was one of the first people to be buried under a funerary ritual, or at least buried in a cave or a specific location with these conditions, and that this is the reason why, even today, burials and funerary customs are something of a standard practice when it comes to the dead. We are told, And in that place all the sons of men made a great mourning and weeping on account of Adam. It has therefore become a custom among the sons of men to this day. Adam's death was significant because he was the first man, so his death was felt more so than anyone else's. Adam was the only person, aside from Eve, to have experienced paradise, and arguably Adam was the last remnant of the earliest times. Within this community, Adam wasn't just a progenitor, he was an actual father to the sons of men. After this, Enoch went back into hiding for three days to pray and learn from God. Then he re-emerged to the sons of men and told them everything he had discovered. This began a trend of Enoch disappearing for a set period of time, and then emerging again for one day to explain what he'd found. On his next disappearance, Enoch sequestered himself away for six days, and then reappeared on the seventh. After this, he disappeared for an entire month, before reappearing for one day, and then he disappeared for an entire year, before again reappearing for one day. We are led to believe that Enoch's disappearances would eventually become so frequent that the sons of men actually tried to seek him out. We are told, All the kings, princes, and sons of men sought for him, and desired again to see the face of Enoch, and to hear his word. But they could not, as all the sons of men were greatly afraid of Enoch, and they feared to approach him on account of the godlike awe that was seated upon his countenance. Therefore, no man could look at him, fearing he might be punished and die. What's even more interesting here is that Enoch doesn't only inspire the sons of men to be better people, but he also inspires fear in them. They come to fear Enoch because of his connection to God, and come to view his wisdom and knowledge as something they ought to be afraid of. In fact, they hesitate to even look at him, for fear of glancing upon something so divine that they themselves, who are not at such a level, would be punished and killed for it. So indeed, whilst they want to find Enoch and benefit from his wisdom and his guidance, they also don't want to find him, because they cannot be sure what to expect from him. Eventually though, Enoch does make himself known again, and though the sons of men were in two minds about seeing him again, they are revealed to be relieved when he graces them with his presence. In fact, just like the previous times, Enoch stays with them to teach them and guide them, and whilst the lessons he shares with them are never told to us, one can assume that these lessons brought the sons of men closer to God, for as already specified, there was peace during these times. Then one day, an angel made itself known to Enoch once more, and it tells Enoch that he must now come to heaven, for God has need of him. We are told, And in some time after, when the kings and princes and the sons of men were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching them the ways of God, Behold, an angel of the Lord then called unto Enoch from heaven, and wished to bring him up to heaven, to make him reign there over the sons of God, as he had reigned over the sons of men, upon earth. As already specified earlier in this episode, it really delineates Enoch's importance that God would want him to reign over the sons of God, the angels, just as he had ruled over the sons of men. 
No other place in the biblical story do we see such a character promoted to this almost elite status, whereby they transcend not only their fellow man, but also the angels themselves. I'm reminded of the Quranic story of Adam and Eve, where Allah instructs all of his angels to prostrate before Adam, and how all of them, with the exception of Iblis, do just that. With this, it isn't entirely out of the realm of religious belief to imagine a man presiding above the angels, and that more than once, such an idea of God favouring man over his more angelic creations is maintained in various beliefs. But even so, it is rare, and only the most remarkable and unique of men, such as Adam and Enoch, are bestowed with such a privilege. Time becomes of the essence after this, for Enoch wishes to teach the sons of men as much as he possibly can before he is called to leave. Remember, though Enoch had been told that he was being taken to heaven, he was not told when he was being taken. So he would have likely been much more urgent in delivering the knowledge and wisdom he had been granted by God. He states, And now therefore I will teach you wisdom and knowledge, and will give you instruction before I leave you, how to act upon earth whereby you may live. And he did so. Whether or not Enoch was able to teach everything to the sons of men, or whether they were really able to comprehend everything isn't really ever revealed to us. What we do know is that Enoch did stay with the sons of men for some time, so it is indicative that he was either able to teach them everything he knew, or get them to at least a satisfactory state of understanding. It is around this time that the sons of men see the great horse descending down from the heavens, and upon witnessing it, know exactly what it means, that it was time for Enoch to go. We are told, And they told Enoch what they had seen, and Enoch said to them, On my account does this horse descend upon earth. The time is come when I must go from you, and I shall no more be seen by you. What's more interesting here is that Enoch doesn't just mount the horse and go on his way. Instead, some might say Enoch was a bit nonchalant here, choosing to delay his ascent and remain with the sons of men for a moment, as he tells them, Where is the man who delighteth to know the ways of the Lord is God? Let him come this day to Enoch before he is taken from us. Enoch actually waits here, choosing to delay his ascension, until all the kings, princes, judges and everyone else in the land come to assemble around him. There he spends the remainder of the day dishing out the last vestiges of information he has, in the hopes that these last few lessons will be enough to see humanity off peacefully whilst he is no longer amongst them. After this, he does mount the horse and start to gallop away, but we are told that the sons of men, 800,000 of them, end up going with him, even though they had no idea where it would really lead, nor what it was that awaited them when they got there. This just goes to show the effect that Enoch had on the sons of men, that they would follow him anywhere, for however long, without question and without hesitation. On the other hand, of course, you might argue that some of them had seen the magical horse now coming down from the sky, had now known Enoch was going to heaven, and so sought to go with him to grab a piece for themselves. Of course, this is not explicitly told to us here in Jasher, and so the simplest idea is that the sons of men end up following Enoch out of loyalty and admiration. The simplest idea of the sons of men following Enoch out of loyalty and admiration is probably the correct answer, and easily the more poetic. By the second day, Enoch did turn to those who were following him, and told them to return home to their tents. It's likely that whilst Enoch did appreciate the commitment and loyalty to him, he was also cautious not to intrude on God's invitation by seemingly bringing these people with him. Remember, the angel had sent only for Enoch to ride to this particular place so that he might ascend so it was not known what would happen to anyone else who went to this place with him. Secondarily, Enoch was looking out for his people. He did not want them to be raptured, because he could not guarantee that they would end up going to heaven with him. Despite their devotion, only Enoch was handpicked by God, and so those who went with him did so at their own risk. Enoch is seen to be quite direct with his followers in this matter, as we are told, 
And the second day he said to them, Return home to your tents. Why will you go? Perhaps you may die. And some of them went from him, and those that remained went with him six days journey. And Enoch said to them every day, Return to your tents, lest you may die. But they were not willing to return, and they went with him. Interestingly, you'll notice that while some did heed his warnings and returned home, many did in fact stay with him and rode with him all the way to the end, to perhaps their own detriment. After all, by the end of the chapter, Enoch's warnings were not without merit, because those that did follow him are never seen again. Enoch is noted as trying very hard to dissuade them from accompanying him on this journey, but that despite his best efforts, they could not be discouraged. In fact, he grows so tired of telling them to leave him alone that in the end, he stops bothering entirely, as we are told, and they urged so much to go with him that he ceased speaking to them, and they went after him and would not return. On the one hand, it can be speculated that because of their loyalty and devotion to Enoch, God did rapture these people too, and they, like Enoch, were taken up to heaven and spared of death. But on the other hand, one might argue that these people, who had come to idolize Enoch, were destroyed by God, because it was not their love for God that led them to this very place, but instead their love for Enoch. Furthermore, they may have been punished for refusing to heed Enoch's warnings, and for assuming that they too could get to paradise if they followed him there. Due to this, it's feasible that God vanquished these people for not obeying Enoch's instructions, those that were indirectly his own instructions. After this, on the seventh day since Enoch's departure, the kings who did have the sense to return home decided to take a census, which just goes to show how many people had followed Enoch to their possible doom. Indeed, so many were missing that it prompted the leaders of society to take count of just how many they even had left at that point. This is also the same day that Enoch ascends into the heavens in a whirlwind of chariots and fire, much as Elijah is in the Bible. Now, upon taking the census, it seems probable that the number of missing people was too great to ignore, so the kings decided to send out search parties in hopes of finding these lost men. We are told that all those kings went to the place where Enoch had ascended, but interestingly, they only found snow, with large stones that were also made of snow. Where these formations came from are not revealed, though they do baffle the kings who find them, leading them to even break them apart in the hopes of finding some kind of clues. One man amongst the entourage even suggests that perhaps those who went with Enoch were buried under the stones. To their dismay, however, even after uprooting the land, these men who followed Enoch were never found, nor was Enoch ever seen again, for he had now ascended to heaven. Since Enoch's appearance in Genesis as a man who walked with God, as well as the mystery of being a man who was taken away by God, thus avoiding death, his character has come under huge speculation, making him a figure of fascination and reverence. And that's without getting into the Book of Enoch, where Enoch is seen to chastise the Watchers and to go on exciting adventures through the cosmos with the Archangels. As far as we can gather from the biblical count alone, Enoch's brief but insightful description may serve as an example to believers of how one may aspire to please God and what the reward of committing to such a thing might look like. Enough to escape death, perhaps. As far as the Book of Jasher goes, meanwhile, Enoch is far more fleshed out as a man whose direct and close relationship with the divine makes him an exemplary figure on the level of the likes of more popular characters, such as Joseph, who's since been pegged as one of the most exemplary figures in the Old Testament account for his faith and trust in his God. Enoch in the Jasherian account also presents us with a character that possessed great wisdom and knowledge, so great in fact that it was enough for God to take notice, nurture, and glorify. Through this, Enoch becomes more than just an exemplary figure that the biblical account boxes him into, but instead an incredibly wise figure that was instrumental in saving the sons of men and teaching them a better way.
As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Also, check out my new Gilgamesh inspired merchandise over on my store. Link in description. Until next time.